Hi, I'm Judy Tayabji. Today we start the first in our leaders series about the provincial leaders. There are four provincial leaders, and so far three of them have confirmed dates. We're still working with Gordon Campbell's office, hoping he can come up with a date. Today we're joined in studio with Premier Glenn Clark, and we've prepared a special background video, and we'll go straight to your calls after that. Mr. Speaker, why can't this government be honest, and why can't they simply tell the truth? By this May of 1991, NDP finance critic Glenn Clark was known for his aggressive style. In October of 1991, he was elected with an NDP majority under Mike Harcourt's leadership. Within two years, Mike Harcourt had made Glenn Clark the most powerful minister in cabinet. I have been given explicit instructions from the Premier to uh, get on with the job of transportation, integrated transportation planning, and an economic strategy for the province. That's the number one. But the NDP faced a rocky road, and within two years of Clark's Absolutely. appointment as Minister of Employment and Investment, Mike Harcourt resigned. Within a few months, Glenn Clark himself declared for the leadership. Ten years ago, I ran to become the MLA for this area to represent working people and their families, and today, in order to represent working people, Throughout British Columbia, I'm proud to announce my candidacy for the leadership of the BC. Glenn Clark won the race in a landslide to become the youngest premier in BC history, and he set a very different course for the premier's office. I think the public want to know um, where we're going in the future more than they where we've been in the past. They really are worried about the future and. Uh, when Glenn Clark called the election in 1996, he was trailing the Liberals in the polls. But after a hard-fought campaign, he was returned to the Premier's office with a very slim majority. Winning that government has been hard work, and it was incredibly close. But friends, we did it. After the election, Clark put together the smallest cabinet ever. But with the surprise defeat of Finance Minister Elizabeth Cull, some critics charge that the new cabinet is a close inner circle, a young boys network. The youth and the new direction of the premier have allowed us to see him in different roles. Go. Go. Ladies and gentlemen, that is pathetic. <laughs> better keep your day job. Back after a quick break with your calls to Premier Glenn Clark. Tayabshi is brought to you in part by CFAX 1070, Victoria's news authority. I still remember getting my first candy from my grandfather. It was Werther's original, and I was four. I'll never forget that first taste. Sweet and creamy and just plain good. I felt I was really somebody special. Now, I'm the grandfather. And what else would I give my little grandson but my Werther's original? He's somebody special, too. BC's best Chevy dealers made Chevrolet an offer. Send us 300 extra Cavalier Z22s. We'll sell them in just 21 days. Chevrolet said yes. 300 new Z22s are arriving this week. Here's the incredible part. Even equipped with spoilers, sport alloy wheels, tack, and more, you get all this plus that low monthly payment of $198 a month. $198. See your nearest BC's best Chevy dealer. Do it this week because when these 300 $198 a month Z22s are gone, so is this special price. This year we decided not to do our taxes. We're never going to do our taxes again. We were paying way too much tax. Our situation was getting far too complicated, and we decided that we had better things to do. We just said, forget it. Uh, and that's <laughs> when we decided to, uh, you know, get out of the country for a little while. <laughs> Video games are not what this little girl wishes for. She needs the gift of life. Give blood. 
there can be no greater gift. Premier Glenn Clark made history twice, first by being the youngest Premier in BC history and second by winning the NDP a second term. But it's a slim majority and there's been some controversy. He joins us today in studio to take your call and to answer a few questions from me first. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, great to be here. Congratulations yeah. on the show, by the way. Well, I appreciate that. You're the first of our four leaders in the series. Great. Now, I, I want to uh, cover a couple of things that have been raised since the election. Uh, you went into the election campaign. Uh, with a balanced budget projection. It was based on Treasury Board taking a 3% growth rate from the commercial mm -hmm. banks. A little bit less, 2.5, 2.6%. Two uh, two okay, so we're looking at 2.5%. Uh, however, the BC Central Credit Union had projected a lower growth rate. Have you, and, and whether or not you lied or you did it based on good faith, I think people want to know if this year's budget has been uh, you know, based on more accurate right. projections. Well, well, it certainly didn't lie, and uh, and to uh, and I know that's been an accusation hurled by the opposition and kind of gutter politics we see in the 90s, but uh, what we did was we put forward forecasts based on an average, really, of all the private sector forecasts and internal forecasts. They were too optimistic. Most All the banks were wrong in their forecasts. Even the, the Central Credit Union even, was right. Even BC Central Credit Union looks like they were too optimistic. And so uh, for this year, obviously, uh, the Minister of Finance, Andrew Petter, is working with the various forecasting agencies, and we're being uh, much more conservative. So if there's any shocks, hopefully it'll be on the other side of the e equation. If you had to do the election over again, would you look for the conservative forecast instead of the road? Yeah, I think, I think in, in retrospect, clearly, because we're so close to a balanced budget, you know, it was very small surplus that um, it did, uh, I think, uh, made it easy to go down into a deficit position. And I think that's uh, caused a lot of problems for us. However, you know, we've been doing budgeting in British Columbia for a long time, and it's generally the case that you take uh, a range of forecasts. Those forecasts were up for public debate in the legislature. People saw them. Nobody said they were too optimistic at the time. In fact, two of the three other opposition parties used the same numbers. Exactly. A lot of people don't realize Liberal and Reform used That's the same right. numbers. That's right. They used exactly the same uh, forecasts that we did, and they were accepted, I think, broadly. There may be a little bit of criticism. Uh, but nobody projected the kind of drop in revenue or uh, the economy that we saw in the last few months of last year, the first few months of this year. Now, fortunately, things have picked up a little bit uh, in the last uh, six months or so, and uh, so there's been a bit of an improvement. Do people trust you? Well, I think, uh, obviously, the kind of media coverage that we've received, and I've received personally, particularly on this question, I think really has uh, shaken the, the faith of many British Columbians. So uh, I've got a ways to go to earn their respect and support. And in these days, that might be very tough. Well, I don't think it is, really. I think the public uh, see through a lot of the criticism, a lot of the name-calling. I think they want to look at substance. They want to look at results. Okay. And so I've always been up front with people. I intend to continue to be so. And I think at the end of the day, they'll see that we're running a, uh, the province is doing very well. Okay. Well, let's look at substance and results then. Uh, yeah. Surgical uh, funding. Yes. Today, cancer clinic funding. What about things like uh, alternate health care, preventive health care? A lot of people say we could get away from the high capital costs if we just took some preventive measures. There doesn't seem to be any movement. In fact, if anything... Uh, there's a clawing back of some services like chiropractic, massage therapy, physiotherapy. No, I don't agree with that. We're the only province in Canada that covers massage therapy, that covers podiatry, that covers naturopathy. We're the only province in Canada that does that, paid for by the taxpayers. We also set up an alternative medicine uh, clinic at uh, 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 Vancouver Hospital, along with UBC, a historic breakthrough of really merging the kind of Eastern philosophy and, and alternative medicine with Western uh, medicine. And we think that's got great promise. So we've tried to maintain funding, but we also think the healthcare system, the hospital system, needs to be well funded to make sure that we take care of it, people in the traditional way that they've come to expect in Canada. Okay, we're going to go to the lines in a minute. One eight 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 three eight three six zero three six. You beat me to it. The lines are jammed, but keep that number beside you, and uh, we'll get to your calls in just a sec. The NDP have been criticized for being too closely tied to big labor. In 1992, you brought out the labor code. A lot of people feel that that's uh, impacted the economy negatively, also the corporate capital tax. There are rumors that sectoral bargaining is coming, that that's the next stage of the labor code, and that what that will mean is that uh, an entire sector of an industry can unionize um, if, if a few within it organize. I'm not sure I agree with your characterization of it, but... No, the Labor Code was designed uh, as a consensus document between labor and management. We think it's done a good job. As a matter of fact, there's been dramatic reduction in the uh, number of days lost due to, due to labor disputes, so I think it's been successful. Are you bringing but, in sectoral bargaining? But under the Labor Code, it's that after five years, under Section 3, I think it is, there's a committee to be formed to look at uh, refinements or, or alternatives or improvements to the Labor so Code. So you might form be, a committee on there it. There will be a Section 3 review at some point in the next uh, literally few months, I believe. And uh, both business and labor will have an opportunity to make their case 
four amendments to the Labor Code. Before any legislation is brought in in the spring. Uh, we intend to, although there could be some legislation in the spring. Uh, wait a minute. If there's there, won't be, be... there won't be legislation in the spring on sectoral bargaining, okay. I don't believe, but there certainly could be some amendments. Okay. Uh, very quickly then, uh, the international incident on salmon, you've been uh, th very loudly saying you, you're prepared to take on the Americans even if you can't do it formally, maybe you'll inspect all their boats. March 15th is the big day for that. What's going on? Well, as you know, we've got a, a real problem in the salmon uh, industry in British Columbia, the fishing right. industry. Right, Which is, brings in a lot of money. Yeah, there's two problems. One is uh, our ongoing uh, debate about how it should be managed with the federal government, and I think they've made, made a mess of many parts of uh, the fishery. But the bigger debate you're referring to is one between Canada and the United States. We have right. a treaty between our two countries right. about how to allocate the fishery resource. Alaska essentially is unilaterally breaking that treaty. And the problem, of course, is that uh, fish don't know any boundaries. And so as they swim through Alaska, destined for BC waters, uh, Alaskan fishermen are catching them. Right. And the problem is there are some salmon runs in British Columbia which could be extinct. Certain species could be extinct if we don't deal with the Alaskans. We've tried so we'll stay tuned on this one then. Well, we're going to take as much action as we can to pressure the, the Americans to live up to the treaty because we think it's important for the future of our industry and mm -hmm. important really just for environmental reasons so that we don't see uh, a species of salmon be become extinct in this province. Okay, more to come on that. We're going to talk to Anne and Victoria. Anne, you're on with the Premier. Hi, uh, I'm a single disabled mother of three children. I'm used to working full time. For the last two years, I've been on the social services system. I would like to know if the budget includes work initiative programs for disabled people. Okay. And why are we considered unemployable by the Ministry of Skills, Training and Labor? Okay, good question. That's a very good question. Uh, we tried in the BC benefits reforms to, uh, to improve uh, support services for disabled people. One of the problems in the past was uh, to qualify as disabled to get any of the relatively modest benefits that you do receive. Right. You had to sort of swear an affidavit that you were unable to work. Right. And we've been working with the dis disability community to try to see if we could fix that because... Is there going to be a change maybe by the spring? Well, there has been some changes, so I'm not sure uh, what more. We're working through those changes and working through uh, uh, with uh, the disabled community. We have put some more resources into a work program. In fact, statistics show that uh, work experience programs with disabled people have the, probably the best chance Very of success. Very successful, yeah. Okay, we're going to talk to Ken in Powell River. Hello there, Judy. The Hi. man that, that you're sitting next to has shown a new level of political corruption in this province with his NDP party. There has been uh, countless loads of scandal involving his party, and he has shown a new level of political corruption. By okay, Ken, I wonder if you us. have a question for the Premier. I do not have a question for that individual <laughs> who I can a liar. Okay. My goodness. Now, uh, Ken uh, is actually saying things you haven't heard before, that you have heard before, I should well, say. Well, I certainly don't hear it from, from uh, real people normally, but I do think that there is uh, a clear level of uh, cynicism and uh, a level of debate in this province, which I don't think is healthy for democracy. And it's okay. been, we just get relentless uh, bombardment by the media, particularly by the opposition parties, and I think it's really tainted the debate on real issues that you're trying to raise here on this program. Let's see what we can, uh, what Sean from Pitt Meadows would like to say. Well, first of all, Glenn, that's a bunch of bull. Quit uh, always blaming the opposition. What makes you think we, we could trust you? You are nothing but a lying person, Glenn O'Keel. Go to hell. Oh, dear. Um, okay, now, maybe I should make this clear. Um, it's fine to state your opinion on things, but it would be really more constructive if we could ask a question. And uh, now let's try David from Vancouver. Hi, David. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Good. All right. Uh, as an economic refugee from Ontario, I just want to tell you that I'm truly happy that uh, BC is represented by an NDP government. Uh, kind one, of the other side of the coin. But <laughs> <laughs> one question that I have, however, is uh, when are you going to lift the hiring freeze of social workers for the Ministry of Children and Families? Good well, question. Oh, sorry. I, th I thought that was the extent of it. Um, well, that's an issue we've covered there, quite a bit. There is no freeze on the, on the social workers in the Ministry of uh, Children and Family. We've hired uh, 325, I believe, new social workers just came For on. For the front line. For the front line. And, uh, and despite what you, some rumors of to the contrary, they will all be maintained in next year's budget. Uh, we clearly have a priority for children. We're working hard with the new ministry to get uh, support to the front line workers. Very tough job. Right. And in fact, uh, they're going to be indeed a big challenge. Expectations, I think, are very high, but we're trying the best we can, best we can to try to deliver. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll take more calls. We're talking to Premier Glenn Clark. The number is 1-888-383-6036.
Siam Shi is brought to you in part by Metro Lexus Toyota, Victoria and Duncan. I don't believe it. They've come a long way. <laughs> I mean, I don't recall them ever tasting this good. Low-fat Quaker rice cakes and corn cakes. You gotta taste them. Hey, it tastes good. It's sweet. I like it. I love that caramel one. Caramel? <laughs> I'm in trouble. I could eat a large quantity of these. Whoa. Major crunch going on here. Seriously tasty treat. Well, you feel like you're snacking. I'm in heaven. You gotta taste them. You gotta taste new chocolate crunch coming soon. Still renting. With interest rates and the price of homes at their lowest point in years, it's a lot more affordable to buy a home today. Don't forget, too, when your home increases in value and you sell, the profit you make is completely tax-free. Still renting. Think about where your money's going. Get Canada's top producers to help you find a home. Call Remax first. Low-fat baked Lay's potato crisps. What? With just 1.6 grams of fat per 28-gram serving, you may be tempted to eat like a... Don't even think about it! Baked Lay's. Bet you can't eat just one. Prearranging a funeral is kind of like buying an insurance policy. I mean, you cannot absolutely predict when something might happen. I never thought about it like that. I don't want Joan and the kids to have to take care of my funeral at a time when they're under a lot of stress. By prearranging my funeral, I can guarantee that all the decisions will be made and the paperwork will be taken care of. It just makes good sense. Ask about our pre-arrangement plan that guarantees funeral costs at today's prices. I'm here Glenn Clark and we're taking your calls to 1-888-383-6036 and let's go to Arthur from Victoria. Hi Arthur. Hi Judy, how are you? Fine, Enjoying thanks. your show. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark, when you were running for election, uh, one of your main, the main things that you said was that you represented middle class working people. Right. Right. Um, what about the rest of us that don't fall in that category? Do you not represent us? Okay, that's an interesting question. No, I think uh, obviously when you're the government, you have to represent everybody, uh, wealthy, uh, the poor, the middle class. but You're from East see, Vancouver, so... Well, I do think that uh, if you're wealthy, generally the government doesn't need to help you as much. I do think that the biggest challenge that government faces, and I think the biggest thing I try to represent, is this huge and shrinking middle class. People right. in the middle who feel that their opportunities aren't there, their opportunities for their kids aren't there, and I think uh, that's what I've tried to represent throughout my political life. I've never made any apology for it. I think... Uh, Politicians should stand for something, and that's what I've Well, it's tried important to for people to know where you're coming from. Right. And now we're going to talk to Peter and Victoria. You have a question about the working poor? Yeah, actually, I do. Uh, Mr. Clark, okay, uh, I'm going to try to make this as, as pointful as I possibly can. Okay, I am part of the working poor, right. being subsidized from social services. Now, what I would like to do is eventually buy a home for my family, but, Fair enough. you know, I can't do that with, you know, with all the taxes that are being uh, implemented, you know. Uh, if, if there's going to be cuts, cut the service charges with the banks, and if there's going to be tax increases, tax the banks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that's Thank uh, you. one that we hear all the time. Uh, I didn't get the details of the, of the gentleman's uh, status, I guess, but uh, we've, of course, uh, have a new BC benefit plan, which gives $103 per child for the working poor. I think that's what he mentioned, poor. that there being, there's a subsidy coming in. It's a pretty large, $200 million a year in new money going into the pockets of the working poor to try to reward people like this who are struggling to get by, who are feeding their family, who aren't a drain on the taxpayers out there working. Uh, so we've made a big progress there. We like to see that as a national program, to be honest. But uh, we've made some progress. We have the second lowest taxes in Canada for the working poor. Mm -hmm. We'd like to be the lowest. We're not quite there yet. Right. Uh, but uh, so we've made, made some attempt. But, but and our bank reform is federal. And we do have the mm -hmm. highest taxes really on the banks in Canada. I did that before. It was one of the key issues in the campaign. The Liberals... Uh, in British Columbia are still in favor of cutting You're talking tax about the corporate the capital tax? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're talking to Jerry now in Duncan. Hi, Jerry. Hello, Glenn. Hi. Why does the Family uh, Maintenance Enforcement Progr Program make a person unemployable who has paid support until unemployed as no employer wants to deal with garnishes? Okay. Well, that's a family well, maintenance. Yes. Whoa, it's that's a, a big one. It's a very tough issue. It might be nice for another show. Uh, 
family maintenance enforcement programs designed to deal with, uh, with fathers largely who are not paying uh, support uh, for the children, the, uh, their children. Or uh, moms. Uh, or moms in some cases, but in, off, in most cases, the vast majority are delinquent fathers. Yeah, and but in a lot of cases, I mean, the mandate for family maintenance is uh, that they only focus on a narrow thing. There could be money outstanding on the other side if it doesn't do, deal with maintenance. Well, as I said, this is, this is, an area, access, this is a complicated deal, area, yeah. but we are, you know, I think it is important that people take responsibility for well, their children yeah, you don't get and back financially that. as well. And so uh, that's the purpose behind it. And I know there are lots of criticisms, uh, both from people who don't think it's tough enough and people that think it's too tough. Well, let me make a point to, the, to that caller. We will have the Attorney General on at some point to talk specifically about uh, family-related issues. Now we're going to talk to Robin in Vancouver about schools. Hi, Robin. Hi, I'm actually from Richmond. <coughs> Richmond. My question is, why, what are you going to do about the uneven distribution of money for schools? Okay. Um, as Richmond has done what the ministry has required in terms of longer hours and putting in community centers. Good Great. question. Yes, well, Hot topic. the only unevenness about the distribution in the last five years has been that uh, Richmond's received more money in the last uh, four years than any time in the history of British Columbia. Now, it is true that when we we've lifted the capital freeze, the first uh, few announcements were not in Richmond, but I can give the uh, caller uh, complete confidence, comfort, that we will be proceeding with construction in Richmond. We said within six weeks of the previous announcement, I think so within the next few weeks, we'll have some announcements because Clearly, we are committed to funding education. We're committed to building schools important for the province, and we intend to get on with it. Okay. A lot of controversy on that one. But yeah, I, I think, well, we'll, again, I'll, we'll, Maybe we'll have the Minister of Education on sure. to answer that one. Okay, we'll talk to Greg now in Nanaimo. Hi, Greg. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, Judy and uh, Mr. Premier. You're doing a great job there, Judy. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I wonder if the Premier could uh, basically uh, tell me why the government uh, appears to be basically governing under special warrant and uh, why the legislator, uh, legislature uh, has not been sitting. Okay. Thank okay. you. Good question. Actually, the ledge hasn't been sitting much. Uh, no, this would be the shortest time to go back, actually. So I don't understand well, <laughs> the caller. The normal, in this province. In this province, yeah. the normal uh, process is for the legislature to go back in March and finish sometime around the end of June. But not in other provinces. This, this, yeah, that's true. But in this year, uh, we sat right through to August, and we'll be going back in March, the same as normal. So yeah. there's no... Uh, there's no attempt. In fact, I really look forward to going back to the legislature, as yeah. you know, Judy. And uh, so I think we'll be going going back in a few weeks. I'm I think actually uh, you're not on special warrants, you're on, you're, but nope. you are ruling by order in council right now. No, there's no special warrants. The budget is passed. And, but the uh, order in councils are there. That's how you're making decisions now. No, that's how you make some decisions under right. the legislation. But uh, the budget is passed and we're living within it. In fact, of course, we're coming in underneath budget in most cases. Okay. Let's go to line seven. Hi, line seven. I don't know your name, but go uh, ahead. Name's George. Hi, George. I was wondering what, whether Premier thought of uh, fisheries. I, I, I'm of the opinion that uh, our fishery resource should be managed like, you know, forestry and mining and have nothing to do with the federal government. Yeah. I was just wondering if he was uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, actively approaching, you know, that yes. situation. Great. Yeah, Good I, question. I completely agree, but uh, philosophically I agree. I guess uh, we've tried to move pragmatically on it, recognizing that the federal government uh, uh, doesn't like to give away uh, an ounce of jurisdiction in this area. So uh, we've been working at achieving greater provincial control over this resource, not so the bureaucrats in Victoria can manage it, but rather so that people in the industry and communities and environmentalists and others could actually manage this resource on a sustainable basis. So that's what we're working towards. But ultimately, uh, I'd certainly like to see uh, greater jurisdiction for British yeah, Columbia. Yeah, get the feds out of there. Okay, we're talking now to Bill. Hi, Bill. Hello, my name is... Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to uh, say that I'm not a firm believer in uh, no-fault insurance. Okay. Uh, you've got a, a five-second delay on your TV, so you have to listen through your telephone. And uh, I... Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't tell Okay, you know what? I'm going to let the free... No-fault no insurance. Fault. What's going on? Well, what happened was uh, ICBC rates have been rising at double-digit uh, increases every year. I felt it was a real concern to the middle class of working people, so we froze... Uh, uh, we froze ICBC premiums along with tuition and a few other things. And so we've instructed ICBC to try to drive those rates down so that the rate increases do not go so it's, un so it's simply not financially possible. Well, let me possible. ask you this. Will and there so be a debate before there's a decision made? What we've tried to do is... Yes or no? Yes, there will okay. be. But we've tried to have ICBC now go and look for ways to cut costs. And okay. so one of the proposals come up as no fault, uh, but it's simply one of the proposals that's before uh, the government. Okay. In 2005, what will be the number one industry in BC and why? Oh, very good question. I still think that the forest industry will be number one in 2005, 
and it will be because we're making changes to get more jobs from the trees we harvest, move in a value-added direction, and to have a truly sustainable and dynamic world-class industry. Okay. Clearly, there are other industries that are growing very fast, like tourism and the like, but I think uh, forestry still has a great future in B.C. After the next election, will you be the Premier? Oh, very good question. Uh, I'll let the voters decide that. I've never been presumptuous. Okay, so it could be quite a few years away before we, re before we reach that point. <laughs> um, if the Liberals and the Reform Party form a coalition, can they defeat the NDP? Oh, I think the public would look uh, very, very suspicious at uh, them getting together for, uh, you know, really our opportunistic reasons. I think that was one of the problems for Mr. Campbell, that he was clearly pandering to certain uh, people to try to desperately defeat the NDP government. I think the more he talks, the more it's obvious that he'll say anything and do anything to try to get elected and not stand on principles. So I'm not too worried about it, to be honest. So we don't know. Well, we've been talking to Premier Glenn Clark. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, I'll be back in a minute with my opinion tomorrow at 11 a.m. on CKNW, which is AM 980. Bill Good will be hosting Reform Leader Preston Manning. Might not want to miss that one. Back after a quick break with my opinion. New Purina Chicken Meal and Rice Formula Cat Chow. It's as nutritious as specialty foods like Science Diet Feline Maintenance. But how will your cat like it? Purina Chicken Meal and Rice Formula. It helps you feel so fine and gives your fur that shine. Meow, baby. If home is where the heart is, follow your heart to Spring Home Show 97, Victoria's biggest of the year. From February 28th through March 2nd, see the latest, greatest, newest innovations for every area of your home. Get free advice from over 500 experts. See over 40,000 square feet of special home show pricing and do some comparison shopping all under one roof. And for the kids, there's Cinema Zoo, an exotic reptile and insect show. Spring Home Show 97, sponsored by Columbia Fuels, runs February 28th through March 2nd at the Memorial Arena. So come on in, make yourself at home. You've waited a whole year, now it's here. The 1997 Vancouver International RV Show. Mark your calendar for the greatest RV show in Canada, February 27th through March 2nd at BC Place Stadium. Tent trailers, travel trailers, three wheels, truck campers, motorhomes, mini motorhomes, even rental units, all on display at huge discounts, plus zero down financing and low monthly payments on hundreds of RVs already low show price. The 1997 Vancouver International RV Show. Four days only. Don't miss the greatest RV values of the year. CDI College opened opportunities I never imagined possible. They gave me the training I needed for success in the current technology job market. And they offered me the right options to suit my needs and schedule. People at CDI really care. From my first phone call to the job search program, they were with me all the way. Do you have what it takes? Serious technology training for serious jobs starts soon. Call CDI College of Business and Technology and prepare yourself for a new career. If you've ever experienced a sexual assault or you know someone who has, then you know that this can be very traumatic. Well, the good news is that the RCMP, nurses, and others in the system are getting together to make sure that prosecution is much easier. Today we concluded the first in a four-part series on the provincial leaders in British Columbia. We talked to Premier Glenn Clark. He's currently sitting with a three-seat majority in the House, a slim majority, but it is the first time that the NDP have ever won a second term in BC. Some say that's because the right wing is fractured into three other opposition parties. Over the next few weeks, we'll talk to some of the other leaders to find out what they think the future holds for British Columbia. In about a month, the provincial legislature will reconvene. We're in the only province in Canada where we don't have regular sittings, and we frequently, in fact, only once since the NDP took power have we had a fall sitting of the legislature. But it's time in this province that we went beyond the name calling, focused on the issues, and made sure that the most important things are being paid attention to. Join me tomorrow at 12.30. I'm Judy Tayabji.